still there. Uh, and I'm a longtime member of Northern Plains. And um, I met John Boyd a few years ago. We were on a kind of a Zoom presentation uh, with uh, Jim Hightower. And so, um, so now I would like to welcome back and introduce you to our keynote speaker, John Boyd. John is a fourth generation farmer and civil rights activist who spends most of his time running his 1600 acre farm in Southern Virginia. His other time is spent being a constant voice for change. He founded the Black Farmers Association after experiencing discrimination directly from the US Department of Agriculture and learning that other Black farmers face similar discrimination. Today, the Black Farmers Association continues to advocate for Black farmers' rights across America. John is also a past nominee for the NAAC's highest honor medal and he served as an agriculture advisor for the state of Virginia. We are so excited for John to be able to be here in person with us this year. And with that, I'll let John take it away. There we go. Yeah. No. That's a good me. There we go. There we go. It's so great to be here uh, today. And uh, thank you, my good friends, for that warm introduction. And uh, I'm happy to be here today. How about that? How about that? Uh, first of all, uh, I'm a very religious man, so I'd like to give honor to God first and foremost. Uh, take him everywhere with me because, uh, so they never leave me alone, you know. And I've been on some, we're in some battles over the past uh, 40 years. I'm a fourth generation farmer from Baskerville, Virginia. My daddy was a farmer. My grandfather was a farmer. My great grandfather was a farmer. And uh, I I guess I didn't have any choice but to be a farmer. But uh, my experiences as a farmer has been uh, both good and bad. And I would like to talk to you today uh, about uh, the good side of uh, being a fourth generation farmer and some of the struggles that I faced uh, as, as a farmer. And I would just like to recognize the, the, the nominees and the award winners uh, today and give them a special round of applause because. They'll make up your organization. They're the future of the organization. Please give me another round of applause because they're doing the great work for Maryland Plains. And we can do a little bit better than that. We can do a little bit better than that. Yes. Recognize those that make grassroots great. Great. People who do the work on the ground. Oftentimes, we don't recognize the little people that do the work and make organizations like this great. You guys are doing great work. I, I listened to the presentation this morning and I looked at the lineup and what you're doing. And I would like to give your organization great points. Another round of applause for sticking up and standing up for Montana and other parts of this country that wouldn't have a voice on these issues if it were not for the persons in this room. So. Let me say that first and foremost. And uh, the last time I spoke by Zoom last year, uh, you know, I lost my father. You know, we, we worked together for 40 years uh, as, a, as a farmer, and he taught me many great things. In fact, my father was the greatest man I knew in the flesh. He wasn't the greatest man because he had the most money. He wasn't the greatest man because he had the most assets. He was the greatest man to me because he had the most character. Oh, you hear me? He had the best character. Character means more than money. means more than wealth. The character of a man. And my father trained me to stand on your character and principles. And that's part of the reason why I'm here today. Uh, when I first 
started the farm, I never knew that I was going to take over the family farm and, uh, uh, in, in, in Mecklenburg County, Virginia. And my father taught me a couple of things that he said would carry me through my long journey as a farmer. When he told me how to tell a wind's or not. He told me to tell a wind's or not. He said, boy, take this tie and put it on your leg. And he, man, he could tie a beautiful knot. And uh, I said, Dan, I can't tie that. I said, you got it on your right leg. I'm, I'm, I'm left-handed. He said, well, put it on your left leg. And he put it on the left leg and he told me to tie the wind's or not. And then he says, I'm going to teach you how to plow a mule. And he told me how to plow a mule. He told me to hook him up. I already know how to hook the mule up. I've been doing it all my life. And I went to the first floor and I leaned down on the plow. And he said, no, lift the plow up. And I started plowing. And at the end of the day, he looked at me and said, now, you're ready for life. I taught you how to go on a good interview with a Wednesday night in a white shirt. He said, I taught you how to work by plowing a mule. He said, if you can plow a mule, there's nothing in the United States that you can't do. So thank you, Dan, for teaching me about the Wednesday night. Thank you, Dan, for teaching me how to plow a mule. And I was having breakfast with some wonderful people, some of you wonderful people here today. And, and I was explaining to the gentleman that when I first started farming, I was plowing a mule. And he just looked at me uh, with, with dismay. So. The hard work ethic of farming, the hardest occupation known to man, was no occupation that is, has, requires more difficult work than farming. You know, you can be uh, a, a, a carpenter, you can be all these other things, but the life on the farm never ends. It never ends. The hard work never ends. Construction, you can go and build a building and then. And, and, and you get a break and it starts all over again. I can leave here right now and work 24 hours on my farm as soon as I get there. And I still will never catch up. So it's the work ethic that's most rewarding to being a farmer. It's not the money. It's the smell of the land when the plow first hits the ground, people. And that's what I fell in love with. And my grandfather, uh, these are names that we often forget, never forget. Your elders, never forget those who taught you how to farm. Those are the shoulders that we stand on as farmers. I know that I do. And my grandfather, Thomas Boyd, a very humble man who slept with his deed of trust underneath his mattress. Uh, that's what his land meant to him. And he taught me as a little boy that the land knows no color. The land never mistreated anybody, but people do. This man taught me that with a third grade education. He said, if you be good to the land, John, the land will always be good and take care of you. Never abuse the land. These are things that a simple, humble man uh, who was just a generation away from slavery taught me. And I carry those work ethics around the country and I carry them on my shoulders today. So I'd like for you to give my forefathers, John Boyd, a round of applause, Thomas Boyd, a round of applause, a uh, generation of history. You have to be able to tell history so it doesn't get lost. How you spell history? His story. You have got to be able to tell your story to your children. And they'll be able to tell the story to their children. And sometimes history is what, people? Sometimes it can be painful. Sometimes it can be problematic and trouble for others to understand. But you still have to tell the story of the history, both good and bad. If we don't, we can never learn from it. And we'll never recognize it again when it comes our way. So yes, nothing wrong with history. Some of the things today that I say may, may, may hurt somebody's feelings or it may cause them to go out and go to work, one or the other. That's, that's, what, it's, that's what it's going to be. But I'm glad to be here. And I would like to also recognize my whole family who put up with me for the 40 years I was advocating on behalf of black farmers. Many days I wasn't there for the basketball games and all the things for my children that I should have been there. But you know, I did what God asked me to do, which was carry a torch for a group of people who have been totally forgotten in this country. Uh, today, black farmers are facing extinction. 
at the turn of the century, we were one in 14. One million Black farm families strong in the United States at the turn of the century. Uh, today, we're less than 1% of the nation's farmers. At the turn of the century, we were tilling 20 million acres of land that you heard that gentleman spoke on, on, on Zoom today. Today, we're down to three and a half million acres of land. Uh, yesterday, I was in uh, Delaware speaking to a conference of, uh, of young people, uh, uh, students at Dell State University and USDA and all these others. And when we looked at just the state and Delaware black farmers, uh, there's 79 left in the state of Delaware and 22 that's, that's on grid, 22 farmers. Uh, on grid meaning that they participate in some sort of USDA uh, program. That could be a farm subsidy program, farm ownership program, uh, 22. Uh, so we're facing extinction. And if we don't put some laws in place really quickly uh, to preserve the rich history of black farmers, uh, there won't be any. So that's why I've been on this national campaign uh, to address these issues and try to fix some of these issues. But guess what, people? I can't fix them without you. We can change it. We can fix the, the problems here in Montana. If we work together and band together, guess what, people? There's strength in numbers. Oh, y'all didn't hear me? There's strength in numbers. There's a sense of power with those of black minds so that you can fix problems that we clearly know are, have been wrong, have been wrong for many, many decades, and maybe for a very, very long time. Running a pipeline through, through Yellowstone, people, is wrong. Yes, I said it. And if we don't stand up and elevate those kinds of issues, guess what? The bad guys win, people. We have to let, to let our voices be heard on pressing issues like that. And if you don't, guess what? You give them a step, guess what they'll do next time? They'll take a mile, they'll take a mile next time, and guess what? They'll take your state next time. But if we stand together hand in hand, they can't get past us with a pipe. They can't get past us with a bulldozer. Yes, we have to form coalitions like this to stand up and fight injustices, whether it's in Montana, whether it's in Virginia, whether it's in South Carolina, in North Carolina, in Georgia, that's the way to address these issues. And you know, as I looked at, I've been to 39 cities and townships over the past two months, uh, talking to uh, members of the MBFA. And one thing uh, stood out to me, a couple of things. One is the age of uh, the black farmer in this country, 61 years of age is the average age uh, of a black farmer in the United States. We're tilling less than 50 acres of land and we don't have enough young people that are getting into farming and agribusiness. And that's not just a black problem, that's an American problem. We need more farmers, we need more young people interested in becoming farmers Put the cell phone down and start hooking up the plow, people. And let's go back to work. And let's start tilling the land. And let's start making more food in this country. As the population grows, someone is going to have to produce the food to feed the population. And we can't do it with some old men, people. I'm going to say it. We need some young people. And when I look through the audience around the country, uh, there were uh, elderly black couples coming in without their children and without their uh, grandchildren. That's the problem in this country. We don't have the want to to become farmers. And guess what? My son says, well, daddy, you know, I, I just want to run the business end of the farm. I don't, I don't want to do the work. I said, you can't do the business end unless you know how to farm. You can't manage without knowing how to farm. We need young people to have a sense of catching on fire. You know, when I, when I started farming, man, I caught the farming fever and I never lost it. I fell in love with the farm. I could be a whole lot of things today, but my heart is on the farm. 
We need more young people with that type of attitude to want to a farming. If we don't, black farmers just not gonna become extinct. Farming in general is gonna become extinct if we don't find the next generation of farmers. And guess what? Our own government has to find a way to help us do it instead of making it harder. Oh, y'all can hear me? Our United States government makes it more difficult to get more young people involved instead of making it more simple for them to get involved in farming. We already know it's hard work, so don't make their paperwork difficult so that they don't follow through on farming. And here's the thing, people, we $113 billion for countries like Ukraine, and I think they need the help, but I also think surrounding countries in that region should be contributing money and not just the United States, I said it. Where, where is the, where's the aid from the surrounding countries to help supply and, 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 and support these war efforts? It should not be just the United States of America funding uh, a, a war. And the same in the war in Israel, you're gonna see a billions of dollars going to, to, to fight those wars. Not saying that they don't need the money, I wanna be very, very clear. Not saying that we shouldn't support these countries, I wanna be very, very clear. I'm saying we have to do more at home to make sure that we're funding the next generation of farmers while we're helping everybody else around the world. Yes, I said it. Why can't we invest billions of dollars into the next generation of farmers right here at home? We're losing land for a few reasons. One, farmers are getting older, as you, as you already heard me talk about, and it's not enough young people going into farming. But we're also facing foreign entities, uh, such as China. China is buying American farmland in, in my state, uh, like with ease. Uh, uh, we can't even compete at the auction block with the Chinese government purchasing American farmland. And they don't come to the auction uh, looking like uh, uh, a Chinese population. Close your ears and beat a little white guy with the ball cap bidding behind the land for China. That's what, these are real uh, issues here. Bill Gates, uh, we have uh, a Chinese uh, entity on one side of my farm and on the opposite side of my farm is owned by Bill Gates. These are the persons who are buying up uh, farmland. I heard some of the other, other uh, uh, entities out there as well, but I'm like this, I can't go to China and buy their farmland. Matter of fact, I can't even visit there without some sort of spe special visa but they can come to the United States, purchase farmland, and, and do whatever with it, intelligence and all of these other things. America's biggest adversary, uh, purchasing farmland around uh, uh, military bases, uh, African-American schools, St. Paul's and others, have been purchased uh, by the Chinese government. We have, to, we have to look at those things and see how it affects uh, our country right here at home from infrastructure and security and all of these things. So we have a host of issues that we have to deal with right along with what's uh, happening uh, right here at home. And also uh, uh, the president administration, I voted for President Biden. I was one of the first African-American leaders to support him in South Carolina early on in the primary. And uh, we talked about uh, land, land loss, uh, the debt relief measure, I spent 30 years lobbying Congress to get debt relief for black and other farmers of, country, of color. And when it finally passed, man, I was the happiest soul in the country. I said, man, this is great. We're finally going to get debt relief after waiting 30 years to get it. It passed Congress, $5 billion in debt, debt relief. The measure passed. Uh, I, I was excited that 16000 Black and other farmers of color was going to receive 120% debt relief. That means for those who don't understand, if USDA uh, is holding a deed of trust uh, for a $500,000 loan, that you would have that debt forgiven and 20% to pay the taxes. So in other words, you can get your feet from underneath USDA and make yourself a new start. And you get your land free and clear. Uh, uh, most of the uh, farms, farmers, black farmers that are left have deeds of trust tied up with the United States government. So that would have prevented more land loss. And then closer is Sid Miller from Texas 
start suing us in federal court around all these different federal courts, Florida, Texas, and Wisconsin, uh, uh, all of these states, saying that by black and other farmers of color receiving debt relief, that it was reverse discrimination to, to him and other white farmers is what he said. Now, let me say this. Uh, the whole course of the 30 years that I was asking for debt relief in this country through uh, lawsuits and stuff, we never, we never got it. The whole time I was asking for it, Sid Miller never called me and said, hey, boy, I got a problem with uh, black and other farmers of color receiving debt relief. Can we sit down and talk, to, talk about this? He never did. But as soon as it passed, he didn't even call me. He ran to the courts and said it was uh, harm, being harmful uh, to white farmers by black farmers receiving debt relief in this country. And let me say this, uh, the discrimination that I faced as a, as a young black man, uh, one who was very humiliating. I, I didn't know what I was going to do uh, when I faced discrimination in Mecklenburg County, Virginia as an 18 year old African-American male, uh, fresh out of high school and three lettermen and, and some of my best friends in school were, were white guys. Jerry Jordan, we were riding around and having a great time, people, until I walked into the United States Department of Agriculture. And I was buying a farm from another older black farmer. His name was Russell Sally. And he agreed to sell me his 110 acre farm in Mecklenburg County, Virginia. I asked him where could I get money from to purchase this farm? He said, well, you know, boy, the Farmers Home Administration is has a new program that's supposed to be helping uh, black farmers. Won't you, won't you make a try there? And I did, and I walked into the Farmers Home Administration not knowing that uh, what, what I was in for, so to speak. I was green as a raw onion out the ground. I had no experience with this stuff. And uh, this man spat on me, spat on me, spit on me, if you're up and all, for that particular time, I felt less than a man when he spat tobacco juice on me. He tore my application up and threw it in the trash can while I was sitting there in front of him, saying he wasn't gonna lend me any of his money. He referred to black farmers as uh, uh, Negro and colored, whatever you all refer to yourselves as, is, is, is the dialogue that he had. I see that man's mouth is open, he's in dismay. Well, when he, when he, when he said he was, we we'll only see black farmers on Wednesday. On Wednesday, we all knew each other. So many were deacons and ministers and, and local leaders. And uh, by the time I found out what to do, it was years later, and I ran into the civil rights director giving a speech just like this uh, to the NAACP. And she said, did you file any complaints? And I told her, yes, I filed numerous complaints about how, how I was treated at the United States Department of Agriculture. They finally investigate Mr. Garnett. And she said, well, and she played the recording for me. I couldn't believe it, his answers. Did you spat on John Boyd? What do you think he said? He said, well, yes, I spat on that old boy. But I just accidentally missed my spat cane. That was his response to the investigator. Did you throw Mr. Boyd's application and tear it up, throw it in the trash can? What do you think he said? He said, well, yes, I ain't seen much sense in lending the board money when I had done give it all out in the county already. So won't, so won't no money, so won't no money left. She said, well, do you have a problem making loans to black farmers? Cause you only see them on Wednesday. What do you think he said? He said, well, yeah, I think they're lazy and look for a paycheck on Friday, but it has nothing to do with me doing my job. Now, let me say this to you people. The person who has the power is the person who can forgive. No, y'all didn't get me. I forgive Mr. Garnett. You know why? Because a fool knows no better. I said it. A complete fool knows no better. You have to be able to forgive and heal so you can move on and try to address things and fix it. If I don't forgive Mr. Garnett, there's no way I can come in this auditorium today and look at you and say, you know what, I'm just mad and I hate and, and, and I'm hating because of the way he treated me. Sometimes things happen to you so you can go out and address it. 
The same way you have to go out and address these issues is because things that happened in this community that made you stand up and want to fix it, right? And that's what I did. I went on a 30-year campaign to address it, try to fix it through class action lawsuits by acts of Congress. That my first act of Congress, guess what it was? It was to take the word Negro off the federal application so you can call me black or whatever else, but don't call me Negro in 1983. And they didn't just take it off USDA's application. They took it off all federal applications. That was my first victory in Congress. My second victory, when we went to court with the lawsuits, uh, uh, suing the, the federal government for the act of discrimination, they said the statute of limitation had expired. So I went to Congress again and spent a number of years getting the statute of limitations lifted. That was my second victory in Congress. And that passed with the help of uh, Chuck Robb, a, a, a senator from Virginia, a very, very humble man who led the way on that campaign. And we got that lifted. And after we won the lawsuit, we still had to go what? Get it funded. So I had to go back to Congress to get money to even pay for the victory that I had just won in court. So it's always a hurdle after hurdle. And I spent 10 years uh, getting that case, uh, a, a piece of legislation through Congress with the help of former President Barack Obama. And believe it or not, former now President Biden was the co-sponsor and former Senator Barack Obama was the lead sponsor. And Chuck Grassley was also a sponsor on that bill. Now, guess what? Today's Congress is so divided, we can't even get a Republican on the bill today. So we have to find a way to work together out here in the real world. And we also have to find a way in our country to work together in politics. Yes, I said it. You're going to need a few votes over here. And guess what? If they're in charge, they're going to need a few votes over here. Why not do the right thing for America and come over here and vote some, sometimes so that America can move forward in a positive way? Isn't that why we sent them to Washington in the first place? Yeah. Yes. So I thank Chuck Grassley. I don't agree with Senator Grassley on everything. But when I brought this issue to him, he's a farmer, and he understood that without federal aid sometimes, guess what? You can't, you can't compete. You can't stay on the farm like that. So those are the two journeys. So I had two settlements in, in Congress, uh, in courts and in Congress, uh, that uh, took over 30 years to come to pass, a very, very long time. And I'm going to say this about justice. Justice comes slow. Problems come quick. What takes you 30 seconds to get into takes you 30 years sometimes to get out. Justice takes a long time to get. And if you give up the fight for justice, the enemy and oppressor always wins. You got to hold on to the arc of justice and you got to keep pulling it down and pulling it down and pulling it down until eventually you have the perfect arc and you win. That win doesn't happen in a couple of weeks, people. And that's what I try to teach young people. Oh, well, we ain't doing anything. You're doing something, but keep doing it until you win. Don't give up because the fight is hard. Guess what, people? Life is hard. We're all going to have challenges, but you can't give up the fight for justice. And the first thing you have to do is believe in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, everybody in this room, there's absolutely unequivocally nobody else that's going to believe in you. I said it. Believe in yourself. Believe in your fight. Believe in your cause. And stand tall to those who don't believe. Huh? Yes. I'm a Democrat, and I know I ain't supposed to go here, but you ever try to debate with a Trump supporter? Man, it gets stupid and crazy quick, don't it? You have to believe in your cause. 
I'm more of a progressive than I am any, anything else because I believe in radical change. Radical change fixes things, you know? Complacency gives us more of the same. We're just more of the same. You're sitting there. I believe in kicking the door open and let's see how many can run through before they close it. That's John Board right there. That's me. I just described myself for you. You can kick that door open just as quick as I can to see what I can do to fix some things. And uh, let me say, that's right, kick it open. And I'm saying this in a very humble way. You never know how your work is going to affect others, and you never know where your journey is going to take you. If you had told me as a little boy, I'd be standing in front of you guys in Billings, Montana, talking to a room of white folks, guess what? I would say, man, y'all crazy. My journey has took me through every president, Republican and Democrat, in the White House to visit with since I was a kid. And my friends used to laugh at me for being in the FFA. I was the only brother in the FFA. Yes, I said it. I was the brother sitting on the first row because I wanted to find out everything about agriculture. And, my, and the guys who played sports with me, man, they had a field day on that because I was a great athlete. They said, boy, what in the Sam world are you doing in FFA? Guess what? They got a call from the White House and they wanted to meet with an African-American FFA student. Hey, here I go. So yeah, I go. Jimmy Carter was on his, former president Jimmy Carter was on his way out. He was losing with some, uh, some hostage thing over there. And he was going to lose. He was on his way out. And, the, and some of the white guys in my group said, I wouldn't go meet with him. He's, he's going to lose. I went and meet the former president, Jimmy Carter, and I, all I got in was three words. Hello, my name is John Board. And he talked about the plight of black farmers with the understanding that guess what, people? That no other president today has the knowledge of former president Jimmy Carter about what it was like to be a black farmer in this country. I want y'all to give him a round of applause. You're, he doesn't get enough recognition one of the most humblest presidents, intelligent presidents in history is former President Carter, a peanut farmer from Georgia. And guess what? We may be able to use another farmer in the White House now with the way things look. Somebody with good common sense and judgment that can lead our country in the right way. Makes, and fast forwarding, that's the first president I met with. And this is why you have to respect your elders and respect those who mentor you. The gentleman who put, took me in to meet him, his name was Ben Johnson. And I never thought I would see that guy again, but I looked at his name badge. And I was, uh, 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 I was just excited. You know, I mean, a little kid uh, from, from a little black farmer kid from Mecklenburg County, Virginia, going to meet with the president. I was a young teenager, I was in high school. And uh, this gentleman came out, his name was Ben Johnson. And he had, uh, you know, those big afros back then, you know. I had one too. Big old Afro walked in and met with him. Never thought about that guy again. I went on to meet with the other two former uh, President Bushes, and 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 I went in to meet President Clinton on December 12, 1997. And this guy comes out to meet me. He says, uh, "You don't remember me, do you?" I looked at him. I said, no, I don't remember you. I'm already mad. They're getting ready to sell my farm and uh, black farmers are being foreclosed on left and right. I'm not trying to be snowballed by some White House snaffer trying to snooze me before I walk in to see President Bill Clinton. I said, no, I don't remember you. He said, yeah, man, I'm the guy who took you in to meet Jimmy Carter. And I almost fell out. And we became best friends. After that, he's and, and even today, he still gives me advice. Never forget your mentors and always your elders. I said it. They have more knowledge and wisdom. And as my daddy said, I've seen more sons come up and I've seen more sons go down than you have. So you need to listen to me. That's why our children need to listen to our parents. And if you're younger in this audience, you still need to listen to your parents, even if you think they're crazy. They've seen more than you have, they've lived more than you have, and they experienced more life than you have. Give them that respect. 
there's so much uh, uh, disrespect now with this generation towards the older generation that someone needs to acknowledge that it's happening. The way that I was brought up, I would never ever say the things that my kids say to me, to my daddy, never. One, I was disciplined with the belt <laughs> and, and now they call that child abuse, you know? But guess what? The things that he disciplined me for, I never done them again. I never done them again, believe me when I tell you. My dad was a huge man, big old arms and big, you know, was, and I feared my father. And even right now, as I speak to you today, doesn't a word come out of my mouth without thinking what my daddy would think if I said that. That's the presence and, and the amount of respect that I have for my elders. And you can hear me quote my, my grandfather, who had a third grade education, and I was hearing these things at seven, eight, and nine years of age, but I can still quote them to you today at 60. That's the impact that my forefathers and my elders had on my life. And the kids now, you need to have that same level of respect for your, for your father and your mother, whether they're together or separated, and your grandparents. Because when you get down, the outside is gonna forget you, and you're gonna have to eventually come back to your family, and they're gonna be the ones to pick you up. Yes, I said it. Right, wrong, and indifferent. You're going to need your family. For my daddy left here, he said, John, family is the most important thing that you're ever going to have. And if you live a good life, one friend every 10 years, so that by the time you're 70, he said, you ought to be able to have seven friends that you can call and pick you up two states away, cuss you out first, but still come and pick you up. That's good, wise, common sense and judgment. But long story short, with the other presidents, none had the, the, the knowledge of farming other than uh, uh, our, former, our former president, Barack Obama, who became a good friend of mine, signed Claims Remedy Act of 2010 to provide $1.25 billion for black farmers and other farmers, uh, Native American case. The Keep Siegel case was a part of that settlement. Uh, the Hispanic and women's case were part of that settlement. And uh, this, this president as well. And I even met Trump, former President Trump. Yeah. And when he gave his talk to minority business owners around the country uh, in Washington, guess what he spoke about? He, all he spoke about was himself. All he spoke about was the fact that his daddy gave him a $2 million loan in the 70s. A $2 million loan in the 70s is like a billion dollars in 2023. And he said that's the only help he had was a $2 billion loan from his dad. Yes, he said, I got time. But let me wrap this up here. I can go on all day about the struggles of black farmers and what we had to go through. But let me say this to you. Whatever your struggle is, don't give up. It could be the pipeline coming down through Yellowstone. Don't give up for your fight for injustice. It could be the electric company taking advantage of those poor elderly people out here. Don't give up. When people don't believe in you, don't give up. When you don't have two wooden nickels in your pocket and your struggle looks more difficult than it did today. Don't give up. Don't never, ever, 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 ever give up. Keep your hands in God's hand and keep pressing forward and the right change will come. Thank you so very, very much for having me this afternoon. I'm so glad to be here today. So we got about uh, 10 minutes for questions. And uh, if you'd line up with the mic over there. I'd be glad to take some. And guess what, people? That wasn't a speech I had to give you. I was coming over here to look at the speech, but I never made it back. So I'm glad to take some questions.
Got to be one. I ain't going to bite nobody. Yeah. All right. She says she got a question. There you go. I guess this microphone is on right here, right? Yeah. Right. She walks like my grandmother. She's going to make something happen coming up here. Hey. Holding up. Yes. Um, I wonder how you encourage people to come to the land when it's so fucking hard. Yeah, so we talk about thank you very much. You know, there's a uh, and I was she's right, it is hard. And that's why I admit that it's hard. I said it's the hardest occupation on a man. There's a uh, television show that I did with my kids. Uh, and you can see, and you can watch that show. It's called the American Farm, F-A-R-M, and it's on Prime. It's a series, I think, a nine-part series. I encourage you to watch that because it gives you a modern day uh, of what I described to you of struggle that I have with my own two sons. That I hope one of them will step up and and take over the family farm is what the television show was. And you're going to see one who wants to be Richard Petty. How many of y'all remember Richard Petty? They call him Richard. Yeah, man, he wants to be Richard Petty. And he tears apart all and everything on my farm and try to put it back together. And then I have one who's more methodical, but doesn't want to do the farm work. So I'm trying to encourage these two for somebody to say, hey, I want to take over the farm. So I invite you to watch that, watch that television show. And you can see some of the struggles that, that even I have. But we have to be open with young people and we have to show them. My, my son said, daddy, you got to find a way to make farming sexy. I said, I'm too old to make anything sexy. I said, but you can find a way to make farming sexy. Young people need to come up with ways to make farming uh, more, more, more modern for them. So it's not looked upon as, a, as such a negative way uh, just because it's hard work. Farming is the most rewarding work you can do. There's no more rewarding occupation than being an American farmer. I said it. Yes, I'm proud to be a farmer. I'm proud to be a farmer. I'm, I'm going to die a farmer. Whether the government helped me or whether the companies helped me or whatever, I'm going to go to the cemetery being a farmer. Any other questions? Yeah, we got one right here. Hi there, um, this is Gilles Stockton. Last year when you were on Zoom, I, I made the same comment and asked the same question, but we were right at the end of saying so, it, so you really didn't have a chance to, to yes. respond. Um, in uh, 1971, I was employed by the Milestone Co-op of Chula, Mississippi to help them develop some livestock uh, programs. Young guy, I, I knew nothing about nothing. Right? Uh, it was a it was a community of heroes, and they were farmers. And uh, there would not be, I learned, the civil rights movement. Yes, if there were no independent farmers, because if you're a field hand. If you're a sharecropper, yes. if you're a school teacher, you can't stand up. Thank you. And uh, you know what? I didn't talk about my other set of grandparents, but they were sharecroppers, Lee and Ruth Robinson. And uh, they also sold bootleg whiskey. So on my dad's side, I got to see what uh, church going people looked like. They were deacons, and my grandmother led to cry and all of this stuff. But my other set of grandparents, uh, Nobody brought their wives to the shot house people. So I got to see what shucking and driving looked like and what this side looked like. And I used both of those things to defeat the United States Department of Agriculture because I knew within 30 seconds whether you were lying to me or whether you were straight up and walked that and walked that narrow path. But but he's right. Uh, you know, those farmers played such a tremendous role in the civil rights movement. Uh, Martin Luther King and others stayed at farmers' house when they were marching uh, at Selma and all of these other places, it was farming families uh, just like Thomas Boyd and Leah Luke, Ruth Robinson that played a tremendous role. Names that you never hear in those type of movements. You hear Dr. King and others, but there were so many other people 
uh, that played a role. Every person is important. Matter of fact, every person in this room is important. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm important too. Yes, so say it. I'm important too. Keep that attitude and we can do some things together. Just because he's up here on front doesn't mean that your voice is any less than anybody else's in the room. Time for one more question. Yes. Hi, John. Um, Montana's uh, what young people can really do. They got uh, got us to get our environment a major issue. I talked to them with a bunch of them. And I've talked with a bunch of young people after, and I just say, what are you really wanting to see happen? Okay, he also said, what do you want to do about it? Because you may want something, but if you don't do anything, it ain't yes. going to get there. And, in, and, and the more you can get, the more it's going to get done. But you also, you need to go out and yes. see what's going on. You need to go out and see the agricultural departments. Yes. You need to go out and see what's going on. And really, because that's where you're going to get your you know, you're not going to get out of a book. You're not going to get it from just talking to people. And, and they really get excited when they get to seeing it because they come back completely different thoughts. So that's where we have to just kind of be kind of like a shepherd, gently pushing them and guiding them, not trying to tell them what to do or who they should be. Let them find out who they should be. And then you'll see them take off. Let me say this, and then, and then I'm gone. People, love is greater than hate. You know, and, and I use I choose love over all the other nonsense. Uh, love is greater than hate. It's, it's better than injustice. It's better than discrimination. It's better than all of those things. Uh, uh, if we hate, you can't you can't move forward. Love is greater than hate. I love everybody in the day, and I'm gone. I love you. Thanks, George.